Welcome back to Stonewall Farm, Maine. I'm Sam. And I'm Kim. We've been sitting going through kind of our planning for the week as far as making our list of important things we want to focus on. What do you have on your list this week? Um, well, first I want to clean out the kitchen garden some, get rid of the plants that have pretty much died and start producing, and replace them with some winter greens, kale, spinach for sure, and um, try a little new experiment. Put some sheep's wool around them to see if it will, um, well, basically keep slugs away. We saw that. Um, that was a trick that they use in Europe, so we're willing to give it a try. That's a good resource we have, too, right. from the sheep. You know, for myself, I really need to continue focusing on digging potatoes, getting those out of the ground, as well as continue stacking wood for the winter. Yeah. And stuff, so. For sure. Do you have it's other coming. things? Yeah. The tomato processing has yeah. been on my mind. The freezers are full. And um, I'll take a bunch of bags out to frost them, make a puree, but I also need to continue filling the freezer with the ones that are coming out of the garden. Um, the season's just about done, but they're still coming. Yeah, definitely. Well, it, we're kind of at the end of tomato season as right. far as we yes. don't want to eat anymore. Right. But I don't want to eat any, but I know this winter we'll be grateful that we have put them. it up. Yeah. Any meals or anything you're looking forward to that we can take out of the freezer, meats or whatever? Yeah, I think that um, we should keep eating the Swiss chard. Yeah. Well, that's still kicking. Yeah, had a great um, year with that. So I'll take the milk from our milk share and make some um, paneer cheese. And then instead of sog paneer, take a spin and make Swiss chard yep. paneer. Yeah, which we like. Yeah. I think um, I'd like to take out some beef ribs and make those this week with our carrots and potatoes and great. onions and stuff. And yeah, so we'll harvest some of yeah. those. And I think we should pull a chicken out of the freezer because it's John's birthday this week and I know he likes the chicken curry Great. as well. So. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it does. Look but to until it. then, let's we'll just have our coffee and then get our morning going. I can do uh, kale on the other side. Okay. Hey there, Smokey. Problem with these trays is there's no holes, just so you know. Oh, I know what you said, which makes it a real pain. Well, this one, I lied, this one has it. Okay. So with the wool. Yeah. I would say, said just put it around the plant and stuff because the slugs do not like crawling. I think it's they don't like crawling over it. So, it's a try. Like this thickness? I think so because it's going to break down pretty quickly, I think. <laughs> it's like a nice little blanket for them. <laughs> huh? So they look so ridiculous, but it's worth a try. I feel like in some ways, because it retains moisture, yeah. that it would do the opposite. Right. But it's really whether they like it, I think. I'm going to leave the rocks, actually, because we're going to put plastic yeah. on. Mm -hmm. You need more wool. Yeah. However, this looks ridiculous. <laughs> now, let's just think of it as a nice, like I said, a wool blanket for you. For you. I like that. Okay, 100 pound workout. Freezes are full of all the tomatoes that ripened over the season, but they weren't enough to do anything with as far as processing. 
So today, I'm gonna defrost them. Actually, I'll show you a trick on how to peel the skins easily and get a lot of the water out when you go to make something and not just heating it for hours on the stove. First, I gotta figure out how to open these bags. I packed them a little too tight. I'm gonna have to rip it, which I hate to do. Gotcha. So they're frozen solid. I just put them right in the sink, clean sink. already took the stems out and anything that maybe look like an insect had got added or imperfections in general. This is a cold job. So with hot water, I'm going to run it over the tomato and then just rub my hand. And as you can see, the skin comes right off. Some spots where it's still green, you have to work at it a little. That's pretty easy. Much like doing the boiling water and dipping them in. So there's no skin on that. Throw it in a tray. So as you can see, a lot of these were imperfect tomatoes that we just cut around. So there's really no way to see a tomato. We grow mostly Amish paste. And this year we tried uh, Juliet's which are small, paste-like tomatoes. And then we do some heirlooms. We like brandy wine a lot. We tried terracotta this year, for our second year, actually. And actually, yeah, here's one, it's a piece of it. It's more like an orange tomato. But I do find that being heirloom, it can split a lot and it's actually a little bit problematic as far as fruit flies, etc. So I don't know that we'll grow them again. And then let's see, this variety. I'm trying to remember if it's called Black Beauty. Those are pretty good. You get big slicing. Then we always grow sun gold or just salads. But we don't put any up the winter. So that tray is full. So all you're gonna do, put it to the side. So the tomatoes have been thawing all day. And I've been pouring off the water throughout the day and condensing the, con the trays. And then, because it's so close to being done, I'm going to just add more to this colander. It's gonna have to go overnight. It's been all day, but as you can see inside here, it's still draining, and that's all liquid we don't have to boil off. To make our sauces. I'll just cover it with a towel overnight and in the morning I can give this all a puree. One of the things we're going to need to do today is a sheep move. We try to practice or we do practice rotational grazing. For us what that basically means is we'll be setting up one long pasture, the paddock, the whole way down the field, and then we break it up into individual days. Each of these long paddocks last probably between four and six days, depending on the grass that's in it. And then we'll open up a new section for the sheep each day that they come out into it. One of the things we had set up was this netting. All of our sheep are trained to one, la one line of hot wire and stuff, but we're gonna be getting a ram and he was supposed to be coming today, and not today, this week. And 
that ended up getting postponed. So we'll be taking down the net. He's trained to netting, not to wire, the single wire yet. So over time, we'll end up training him as well. So part of what we're gonna do is pull down this old this netting because they're done with this section of the pasture and then we'll be putting up reels of single wire for them to go into. One of the things we've definitely found is if you can train your sh animals, like sheep, to just a single strand of wire, it makes setup and moving so much easier. And they do love the fresh grass. As you can see in here, they get excited for it. So the tomatoes have been straining overnight added a weight just to um, push a little of the water out. And now they're ready to be pureed. I've emptied this many times. It's shocking how much water comes out of tomatoes. But now, see it is just literally like a paste. Just put it in my blender. I'm going to can this, so I actually want to heat it up just to get it um, ready for the water bath. I'm really just doing that to prevent breaking the glass, which unfortunately I have had. And after all this work, it's very upsetting. I mean, this is literally like tomato paste. Okay, the puree is warm, ready to go into the jars. I've already put these in the water canner to sterilize them. I'm just going to put them in a water bath for 20 minutes. And even with all the water that has come out, you would be shocked to see that it still will separate and there will be some liquid at the bottom. I'm just going to make sure the air bubbles are out the best I can. This is so thick. Just rubbing the knife down the side. water bath for 20 minutes and then we'll be complete. Alright, 20 minutes later and actually I don't see a line of the liquid down the bottom. I must have really done a good job with this batch. It's a 
surprising how many tomatoes would boil down to get only three quarts in one pint. But again, this is really thick. There's really no boiling down after this. It can be made into a um, nice thick sauce very quickly. And I think the row going in that direction, you get more sun than up at this end of the row. Is the one I planted. Oh yeah. So that's Baltic Rose? Baltic Rose. It's a good gross one. We'll put that there so I don't kneel in it. <laughs> <laughs> I've figured out a better way to dig these other than just by hand, you know. Well, there's machines, but they're an awful lot of money. And I don't think rewarding. It, well, sure, in some ways it would be as rewarding, but not for heating a village. <laughs> no, <laughs> right, exactly. Or Thanks for just, what we're doing. This is perfect. Exactly. So we heat primarily by wood, probably about 80 to 90 percent. Last year in the winter, um, we turned on our heat only a few times, two or three times, and it was mostly when we left the homestead for overnights to go somewhere and we didn't want our pipes to freeze. That's when we turn on our other heating source, which I'm going to be honest, if you never heat it by wood, it's amazing the difference. Um, you can be 70 degrees in a forced hot air system and still feel cold, whereas with wood, with a wood stove, if it's 70 degrees in your house, it's warm. It's really nice. We purchase most of our firewood, well we shouldn't say most, we purchase all of our firewood in the spring, pretty much as soon as the snow is melted and off the ground. We call up the, the gentleman that we get our wood from and we get it delivered for two reasons. One, it allows it to season for all the spring, summer, and fall before we start burning it. And number two, it's much cheaper to purchase it at that time because they don't have a lot of the people calling for firewood. So it makes a big difference in our overall cost. So for us, we find it's the easiest if we allow the uh, wood delivery guy, who's actually a good friend of ours now, to pull right in, right off of our driveway and drop it right here. And then it allows us to stack for the winter and for drying, and also bring it up onto the house. So it's ideally only moving it up to the house for burning once and it's not too too far away originally when we thought when we first moved here we thought let's put the spot where our wood is getting delivered further down on the land I keep really weird pieces for putting on top of the covering because we cover our wood piles so snow and rain don't get on them and it makes it easier in the middle of the winter helps with drying but also makes it easier because it's not all iced up and snowed up for getting at each pile individually. But I use the kind of real awkward pieces that would be hard to stack 
on the top to help weigh down the cover so it doesn't blow off. But originally our thought was to put the wood, pot, wood lot or the area for our wood kind of way down further away from the house, one so we wouldn't see it. And you know, it does make a little bit of a mess when stuff's dropped off, you know, as far as bark and everything falling off. But what we've found is we prefer it to be a little bit easier and more centrally located for us. Looks like we're finishing up another stack of wood up here on the deck, which only leaves one more and then it will be ready for winter. And the rest of the wood will get stacked over in the wood log. But it's just about time to head in and start cooking dinner. So thank you so much for joining us on the homestead and we really look forward to seeing you next week.